Good morning and welcome to Freedom Church. My name is Leslie and we are so glad that you joined us on this fifth Sunday. It is Memorial Day weekend. We want to give a big thank you to all of our service members of the armed forces, especially those that have made the ultimate sacrifice and given their lives. We thank you and we honor you on this Memorial Day weekend. Drop it in the chat. Let us know what you and your loved ones do to celebrate Memorial Day weekend. And we are right in the middle of our Thank You Holy Spirit Sermon Series. I don't know about y'all, but this series has truly blessed me to be mindful to say thank you as the Holy Spirit helps me throughout the day. And in the spirit of thankfulness, we want to give a big thank you to HEB School District for allowing us to use this space. This is our last Sunday here at Westhurst Elementary School. Do not come here next week. We won't be here. Be sure to watch our social media feeds to find out where our service will be live next week. And 
speaking of social media, don't forget Freedom Kids still streams live every Sunday on Facebook and YouTube at 9 a.m. Speaking of streaming, are you involved with Right Now Media? You don't know what that is? Let me tell you, it is like Netflix that loves Jesus. And all you have to do to get registered is send an email to communications at myfreedomdfw.com and we'll get you all set up absolutely free. You will have access to hundreds of faith-based movies, devotionals, and Bible studies that you even have the option to watch as a virtual group. And we use this platform to facilitate our life groups here at Freedom. Thank you so much for joining us. As you continue throughout your week, we ask that you tag us at MyFreedomDFW and let us know what you're up to as you're going throughout your week and you have those thank you Holy Spirit moments. Share your testimony with us. Tag us at MyFreedomDFW. Be sure to use the hashtag FreedomAnywhere. Now get on your feet. Get ready to shout. Get ready to worship with our Freedom Worship Team. Good morning, Freedom. Is anybody ready to praise our God today? Come on, put your hands together. Woo! Oh, God, we give you glory today. Oh, God, we give you honor today. Can y'all help me say, oh! oh. oh. Say, from the love of from the 
at 6 a.m., 12 noon, and 7 p.m. Y'all don't want to miss this Wednesday, and we have First Wednesday service as well. So we invite you to worship with us on Facebook and on YouTube. Set your alarm so that we can meet you there. Now let's get back into this powerful worship.
one more time, everybody at the top of your lungs. King of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. Father, we love you today. God, we want to be closer to you. We just want to be near you, God. We want you to fill our hearts, our space. God, we bless you as you touch us with the word of God today, God. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Come in this room and saturate our hearts today, God. Because you are the king of glory. And God, we love you. We forever give your name glory, honor, and praise. That is due your name. And it's in that name that guarantees an answer. And that is in your matchless name, Jesus Christ, our King. Amen and amen. Amen. Come on and give God praise if you know that he's the King of glory. And you want him to fill this place. Oh, no, come on and give him some praise if you know that he's the King of glory. And you want him to fill this place. Maybe, maybe you're not excited about him filling the place online because you don't know what happens when his presence enters into the room. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in bondage. And so I'm welcoming in the spirit of the Lord so that I can experience freedom. I need God to fill this place. And maybe, maybe you're saying to yourself, whether you're online or at Westhurst Elementary School, well, well I, I want them to fill the place, yes, but, but you're missing the point. The place is not the physical structure that you're standing in. The place is not the place that was constructed on dirt and sand. The place is the place that he died for over 2,000 years ago. The, the place is the place that he wants to take residence in and begin to change and transform. The place is you. And so I want you to say this. I, I need you to understand this. If you really want God to fill your life, I want you to put your hands over your heart. I, I, want, I want you to put your hands over your heart. I want you to, with all sincerity, I want you to continue to worship and concentrate on who the Lord is and what his presence means. That means that he brings freedom. It means he brings joy. It means he brings peace. That means he brings love. That means he brings patience. And here's what I want you to say over yourself. Lord, fill this place. Lord, fill this place. No, no, no. Say it out loud. Say, Lord, fill this place. Yeah, you got you to sometimes make a, a public declaration to let the enemy know that there is no more room for your lies. There's no more room for anxiety. There's no more room for depression. There's no more room for, for the things that, that, that distract me from my destiny. Why? Because the Lord has filled this place. We have the distinct honor of being hosts for the presence of God. I'll say that again. We have a distinct honor of being hosts of the presence of God. And what that literally means is he dwells in your person, which means wherever he go, wherever you go, he's there. He's with you. I better not get into my message. But I want you to ask him right now to feel this place, to feel this place. And that's you. I think that song is so apropos as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Because there are many of us who are afraid of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of his presence. We're afraid of what he might do, afraid of what he might cause us to say, afraid of where he might take us. But let me tell you something. The greatest adventures I've ever been on have been driven by the Spirit. The greatest adventures that I've ever been on have been driven by the Spirit. And for those of you who are looking for something in your life that goes beyond the mundane, the beyond the routine, beyond the regular Christian experience that has been traditional year after year. You've seen the same thing. I dare you to welcome the Spirit of God into your life. Listen, it's a transformation of you that will bring about a transformation around you. I'll say that again. There's a transformation in you that will bring about a transformation around you. And it simply comes when we welcome the Holy Spirit to fill this place. Listen, in the room, you can be seated. 
those of you who are online, we are grateful that you have joined us. Here is uh, a very uh, um, applicable song, as we say, King of Glory, fill this place. And we say that it is not the presence of a physical building, but it is us. Because this is our last week at our temporary location here at Westhurst Elementary School. Somebody clapping too loud. They don't like the chairs. They're clapping loud in here. For those of you who are online, y'all are like, yeah, I knew y'all were going to be there for a while. That's why I stayed home. And so when y'all get back in the building, I'll be back myself. The reality is the presence of God does not dwell in a physical location. He dwells in his people. And so we are uh, meeting for the last time here, but we will take his presence with us, prayerfully leaving some residue for the people who come back into this room so that they can experience God uh, the way that we have in here. We are grateful. And can I get everyone from Freedom Church, Freedom Church family, just make some noise for H-E-B-I-S-D for allowing us um, to be in this space. If there's anybody from H-E-B-I-S-D that is watching or if you're connected to anybody at H-E-B-I-S-D, I I will say it personally, but I also uh, would agree that we have been blessed by being able to set up here while our church has been renovated from the damage of the winter storm. And uh, it is still under construction. We have uh, a lot of progress. Just to give you an update, we are making great progress. Actually, I'm excited about what God is getting ready to do. There are going to be some upgrades there. It's nothing like God to take a storm and give you an upgrade. That'll preach. Somebody ought <laughs> It's nothing like God to take a storm and give you an upgrade. And so there will be some upgrades in that building. But let me give you some instructions. Leslie said uh, in the beginning of service, if you were online, she said, don't come here. We won't be here. But don't go to 701 either. We won't be there. For the next two weeks, for the next two weeks, we'll worship together again online. This is the great thing about the pandemic. It allowed us to understand that we can gather online in our homes. And y'all, listen, for those of you who just like, I, I've gotten used to getting together, get together with some folks. Create a micro site. Y'all worship together around a computer or a TV. Y'all have some fellowship and get together and do it. I want y'all to get as much online as you can in two weeks because on Father's Day, here's the saying, you can come home. Yeah. On Father's Day, you can come home. We, well, listen, Father's Day it's going to be special. You don't want to miss it. We, we've got some things set up. Uh, the building is going to be open so you can come home to the building. You can come home to, 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 to the atmosphere in person. We're going to have things there to celebrate dads. Come on, somebody ought to get excited. Every man, we're going to celebrate you. I think, ladies, are y'all, are y'all leading us in worship that weekend? The ladies are leading. they like shy. They're like, um, yeah, we thinking about it. The ladies are going to lead us in worship, so the guys are on the worship team are just going to chill, except for, like, uh, the, the band. I mean, you know, y'all need to go get uh, 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 Beauty and the Beats. Y'all remember Beauty and the Beats? Y'all need to go get Beauty and the Beats, tell them to play that weekend. Anyway, y'all, that's, that's my DFW, like, old school folk. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But uh, there, there, uh, there will be a great time, uh, both online and in person, but I am encouraging everyone to come home to church on Father's Day. I promise you that theme has more to do with just showing up in the place. There is more to it than that. So you can come home. Matter of fact, look at somebody around you. We ain't ready to high five yet. We ain't there yet. We ain't there yet. But look at somebody around you and tell them you can come home. You can come home. You can come home. Online, look at them and say you can come home. I don't know if it's the mass or I can't hear them or they're being rebellious, but I actually say it. I didn't hear anybody say you can come home in here. It might be the mask. It might be the mask. Hey, listen, let me, uh, let me ask Savannah to come up here for just a second. Um, Savannah, if you would come up. Uh, I am, I am uh, those of you who are here uh, and you brought your kids to church, you were, you were abruptly told that, uh, that your kids are going to worship with you today. And uh, I wanted Savannah to be able to greet the Freedom Kids. And I want to explain to you after she greets the kids and gives them a greeting so they can at least see a familiar face because they're not familiar with me. Uh, y'all are, but your kids are like, I don't want to hear that guy scream at me all day. Uh, at least they can hear from Savannah. Savannah, go ahead and greet the Freedom Kids. Y'all, wait, before she says anything, y'all make some noise for Savannah. Her and Marisha lead our Freedom Kids team. Yes, yes, yes. Y'all make some noise for her. They, they serve diligently to disciple our kids yes. in the back, and there is no junior Holy it Spirit. To get better than They're that. training these children up. It got to get better than that. Yeah. No, that's for you. That's for you. That's yeah. for you. Oh, oh, for the kids. For the kids. Not for the kids. For you. For you. That's for you. That's for you. All well, right, go ahead and greet those kids. Yes. Come on, Freedom Kids. Good morning. For all of you that are here, good morning. Good morning. How do we say good morning today? 
We can just wave the hands. If you're online, I just want you to say good morning in the chat. But if you're here in the, in the room, I do want to say good morning. I'm glad that you're here. I know that we're in a different room, but it's the same atmosphere. God is still here. We're going to worship. We're going to get a lesson in. Uh, we still went live at 9 a.m. On, online, so you can go back and look at that message. And um, I know it's a little different, but that's just what we do, right, Pastor? That's right. We're different. That's right. We're so we're going to get into today's lesson, and it's going to come from Pastor and Seth. And I just want to say I love you all. All right. Thank you all. Hey, listen, when we go home on, Jan on June 20th, I keep wanting to say January 20th. On June 20th, let's not rush it. I'm already old. Uh, uh, on June 20th, when we go back home, we want to make sure that we're giving you an excellent experience. That means, listen, I think the building might even be done before June 20th, but we're going to take time to prep everything. We're going to take time to prep everything to make sure that there is an experience that you come into that is excellent and distraction-free. The other thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that with our Freedom Kids leaders and the people who are serving you, we have a team that is full and rested and ready to go. And so we decided to take this, this moment to do family worship. Listen, I know there are several of you, based on your conviction and your comfort, who have not yet come back to serving and doing that. So we've had a, a few of our Freedom Kids leaders working every weekend diligently. And the Lord told me, he said, Robert, you got to appreciate them more than just saying thank you. You've got to really give them some real rest. And so I figured you could worship with your kids one weekend uh, this month just so that they could get some rest. And so that's why I wanted you to honor them. And I want us to be appreciative of what it is that's happening in Freedom Kids. They are not being babysat while we have big church. This is a discipleship institution. This is an organism of the church. We are growing together. Amen? Amen. Nobody cares about the kids. No amens. This is a participatory service, guys. You can't sit there quietly. All right, here we go. Online, I hope you're, you're, you're responding. Here we go. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. We're in a series called Thank You, Holy Spirit. We're in a series called Thank You, Holy Spirit. And I gave you the basis for the series and why I'm calling it Thank You, Holy Spirit. Uh, years ago, uh, it was something that changed my life. And so the intimacy of my relationship with the Lord changed. And I began to recognize him in every area of my life. Let me say that again. The intimacy of my relationship with the Lord changed when I began to recognize him in every area of my life. Not only just recognize that he was available, but acknowledge him publicly. Sometimes I look like a weirdo. I'm talking to somebody, and I'll just say in the middle of a sentence, thank you, Holy Spirit. And I don't have a problem with it because I realize and I recognize that the wisdom that I speak does not come from me. It is from the Spirit of God. I don't mind being a little strange because I am not of this world. If you saw an alien, an alien would look, sound, and behave differently than a human. Y'all missed it. If you saw an alien, an alien would look, sound, and behave a little differently than a human. Here's the problem. Many of us as Christians will, all, will, will honor the scripture that says we are aliens and sojourners, but we want to look like everybody else in the world. We, we will acknowledge the fact that we are to be aliens and sojourners, but we want to look like everyone else in the world. I'm not saying be so unattractive that people don't want to be around you, but an alien will intrigue you and draw you in. They're different enough to intrigue you and draw you in, but that you know they're not the same. The problem with the believer is we do not embrace our difference. We do not embrace that we have a different command center. We do not embrace the fact that we have a different uh, uh, place of origin. We do not embrace it. And so in this series, I'm believing that if we get to know the Holy Spirit, it'll make us want to know ourselves a little bit better. And last week we said thank you for showing up. And we dealt with the fact that the Holy Spirit showed up on Pentecost and he did some things, right? He... He equalized us, he empowered us, and he, uh, uh, I forgot the third E, but he did all of those things on Pentecost, and we are excited that he showed up. This week, I want to talk to the Holy Spirit, and I want to say thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a friend. I want to sing the Golden Girls theme song, travel down the road and back again. Somebody know what I'm talking about? Your heart is true. You're a Da, 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 dun, dun. And if you threw a party and invited everyone you knew, and the card attached would say, thank you for, I used to think they said, and the heart attack would say, and I was like, why are they talking about heart attacks? <laughs> thank you for being a friend. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I would argue that many of us have relational issues in our lives. 
I got to be careful because we got kids in here, so I don't want to bore them. We got relational issues. And so when I was thinking about this message, I thought about the fact that friendship with the Holy Spirit is awkward because we don't know how to have friendships with each other. And so today I want to talk about friendship with the Holy Spirit, and I want you to take a double entendre of these principles, and I want you to apply them to the friendships that you have, and also look for them in the friendship that you have with the Holy Spirit. As I was thinking about this, let me read the scripture. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 says, For all who are led by the Spirit, circle that in your Bible, that all those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided, we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Thank you for being a friend, Holy Spirit. The last day of school, my daughter Michaela, we picked her up. My daughter Mackenzie had, my oldest daughter is Mackenzie, my youngest daughter is Michaela. For those of you who don't know, my oldest daughter uh, had been plotting and planning with her friends for a sleepover on the last day of school. They spring it on you a couple of days before and say, hey, can we do this? Y'all know how it is if you got kids. So she went home with one of her friends. Michaela was standing outside by herself as I went to pick her up. And I'm so proud of my kids and every other kid, as a matter of fact, that is in here, teenager, students, elementary school student, for how you've handled the last couple of years of dealing with school and relationships and transition through a pandemic. And here's what my daughters, I was ready to celebrate with them. And so I grabbed Michaela and I put her in the car and she's a little sad. And I said, are you okay? She says, no, I'm not okay. I said, what happened? She said, my friend Mac left before I could say goodbye. Now that doesn't mean anything to you, but she had told me the day before that Mac was moving to New York. She wouldn't be back to the school. Mac, Mac was moving to New York and she wouldn't be back to the school. And so she got let out of her class early and went home. And so she didn't get to see her. So my daughter is sad because she won't be able to see her friends anymore. In the middle of a global pandemic where she had already adjusted to not being around her friends, she gets back to school in late January, early February to start going to school uh, again in person. Mac was one of the first people that she met. They can relate over the name Mac. She is Michaela and she is McClellan. They were friends based on some commonality. And so they walked together through this tumultuous season. And now McClellan was moving away and Michaela wanted to say goodbye, but Mac left early. Mac left early. Mac left in a way that Michaela could not say goodbye. And so Michaela was frustrated because her friend is leaving and she didn't want to uh, have her leave without saying goodbye. Then a couple of minutes later, we're in the car and Michaela says uh, to me, I said, no, she's talking to her friend. Actually, she ended up calling one of her friends on the phone because I gave her some advice about McClay. And I said, listen, what you can do is you can arrange something where y'all can hang out sometime during the summer. I'll make sure that's good. I was like, and just to ease your pain today, I want to take you to lunch. And, and her tears dried up very quickly at that point. She started asking and making requests. After that, uh, she's, I hear her on the phone with a friend. She said, yeah, this has been a la the last couple of weeks have been hard on me. And I'm listening. I'm eavesdropping because that's what parents are supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> come on, somebody. Um, eavesdropping on the conversation she's having with her friend because that's what I'm supposed to do. And she says, the last couple of weeks have been really hard. She, she then begins to talk about how she didn't. I knew this. She begins to begin to talk about how she didn't get into a choir that she auditioned for. She goes to a performing arts school, Makaya, and she's wanted to be in this choir that uh, was a part of uh, something that her other friends were a part of. So now here's another instance of where she cannot be with her friend. And so she said, I didn't get into the choir. Now Mac left before I could say goodbye. She was like, it's just been a bad couple of weeks for me. And I looked around and I said, well, I'm getting ready to take you to lunch. I can't replace your friend, but what I can do is I can take you to lunch. I can provide for you what I have. And I said, here's what I'm also going to do. I love to hear you sing. And I'm going to make sure that you got a platform to sing whenever you want one. So, Jonathan, get ready. Michaela singing in worship next weekend. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Point of this story is that as I was looking to ease Michaela's pain for things that were happening with her friendships, I intervened and told her that she didn't have to be sad about these things, that I would help her celebrate her last day of school, help her get over the pain of losing what it is that she lost. In other words, I tried to console her sorrow by promising her something better than what she lost. In John chapter number 14, Jesus is talking to his friends, and he tells them he has to go away. 
notably, they are messed up because they have been walking with Jesus for three years, seeing him do miracles, everything changed. These guys were insignificant when they came on the scene with Jesus. And now all of a sudden, you can imagine what it's like to be with Jesus. He is a superstar and you are his right hand. Life has changed for them. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going away. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Listen, I don't want that place. I like the place we built. He says, where I go, you can also come. I don't want to go later. What's going to happen to me now? They are getting ready to lose their friend, and ultimately, they are sorrowful. This is why Jesus says in John chapter number 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. Jesus is consoling his friends because the shift in their relationship is getting ready to happen. And in John chapter 14, he introduces them to himself by way of the Holy Spirit. He says, if I go away, it is better for you. I'm going to send you another helper just like me. He says, as a matter of fact, it's better for you that I go away because you've been dealing with God around you. And in this next season, you're going to have God within you. I need to talk to somebody who's been settling for God around you. You come to church, you hop online, you believe that this is enough. But I'm telling you that there is something better. You've been dealing with God around you. And the Lord told me to tell you that you can have God within you. He introduces them to the Holy Spirit, and in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he gives them principles of what this helper, advocate, friend is going to do in their lives. He says, this is going to be the friend like no other friend. This is going to be the friend that when you saw what it is that I was able to do with my power, my might, my majesty, he's going to come in you, and greater works will you do than these works. You you understand that that's in the context of receiving the Holy Spirit. He says, he says, he says, there are going to be things that I've taught you that are going to be brought back to your remembrance, and that's in the context of the Holy Spirit. What does that have to do with Romans chapter number 8, Pastor? You read Romans chapter 8, talked about your, son, your daughter losing a friend, and then beelined all the way back to the gospel of John. I need you to see this. He says, watch this, that, that, that if he does not go away, we will not have this friendship. Jesus promises us a friend that will be much more beneficial to us after he leaves. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul confirms some of the same benefits that Jesus brings up and promise would come from our friendship with the Holy Spirit. And so in verses 14 through 17 of Romans chapter 8, we're going to parallel some verses from John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 about who the Spirit is and why his friendship is important. Now before I jump into the points, I need to say something to you. I need you to understand this. In the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is the most exclusive member of the Trinity. I need you to get this because you, you, you have the Spirit of God living in you if indeed you belong to Christ, Romans 8 and 9. If indeed you belong to Christ, listen to me, if you believe in Jesus, the Spirit of God lives in you. And I need you to understand this, that, that you have God's presence inside of you. That's why I wanted to say that before we were uh, talking about filling this place. It's very important for you to understand that in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is the most exclusive member of the Trinity. If you don't believe me, let's watch this. The Father sends rain on the just and the unjust. He created everyone. The Father has had his hand in the life of everyone that you see. The Son died for all mankind, but the Spirit only dwells in those who believe. He is the most exclusive member of the Trinity. Why do I bring that up in a message called thank you for being a friend? Because everybody doesn't have what you have. (laughs) Let me say that again. Everybody doesn't have what you have. That's, that's a message of personal affirmation to anybody who's struggling with your identity. Everybody doesn't have what you have. Even your experiences, your talents, your gifts, your abilities are unique completely to you. And as believers, here's the thing that you get to do. You get to couple that with the power of God on the inside of you. Everybody doesn't have what you have. And so I want you to understand your relationship with the Holy Spirit today from a friendship perspective. And I want everybody to lean in and hear these three simple principles because there were some things that I wanted to do I had to cut out because I don't have the time nor can I go that deep when I got a whole bunch of kids in the room that's going to check out on me in just a minute. So here we go. The first thing I need you to thank him for is, Holy Spirit, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for guiding me. Chapter 8 verse 14 of Romans says this, for all who are, watch this, led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For all who are, say this with me, led, somebody say led. 
all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Paul exclusively says that there is a distinction for the people who say that they are God's children. They are not God's children because they proclaim it just with their mouths. They are not God's children just because they show up in a certain place. They are not God's children just because they, 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 have, they have declared that they are the people. Now listen, don't get me wrong. With the mouth you make a confession to where salvation is made, but the truth and the evidence of that is are you led? by the Spirit of God. You can say that you believe Jesus, but who's leading you? you? You can say that you trust God, but who's leading you? I need, I need to go here for a second. Is pop culture leading you? Is, is, is political influence leading you? I'm going to take it even deeper. Is your pastor the only one leading you. I, I don't mind leading this organization, but the Holy Spirit needs to be leading you individually. Matter of fact, if you're not led to be here by the Holy Spirit, you're Jonah on the boat. You missed what I said. Can I say it again? I'm going to slow down and say it for those who really understand their Bible. If you have not been led by the Holy Spirit to be here, then you're Jonah on the boat. And every storm that we're experiencing is going to continue until you get tossed out into your own assignment. Here's what I need. I don't need to just lead this church. I want to lead people who have been led by the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me. Romans 8 and 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. I need you to see something. The reality is when the Spirit leads you, he begins to give you instructions on what it is that you are to do step by step. I need you to get this. The Holy Spirit, when I say thank you, Holy Spirit, I'm saying that the Holy Spirit is giving me what, what I call instant revelation for the moment I'm in. When I say thank you, Holy Spirit, I'm getting instant revelation for the moment that I'm in. Doesn't mean that I don't see the big picture of my life, but I am reliant on the Spirit of God to guide me every step of the way. The problem with the church is we got a lot of brochure Christians and not blueprint Christians. Let me help you understand the difference between a brochure and a blueprint. Here's the reality. When you get a brochure, a brochure is a fully laid out invitation to look at something that is already complete. It is inviting and entertaining. And what we look at it when we see a brochure is it's enticing us to participate in something that's already done. Watch this. What, what we want is a do-for-you Christianity that the brochure is laid out. And this is what God is going to do. And I'm not, I'm not discounting the promises of God, but many of us want a brochure Christianity like Disney World, that we download the brochure and we show up, everything is already done. The mouse is already there. They're picking up the trash. They're doing all of the stuff. We don't want to have to participate in our own miracle. We don't want to have to participate in our own growth. We don't want to have to participate in it. There's a difference, Alan, between a brochure and a blueprint. And the Spirit guides us through what reading the blueprint. You understand that the Bible is not a brochure for you to look at. It's a blueprint for you to learn. The Bible is not a brochure for you to look at. It is a blueprint for you to learn. Why, why do I say that? Here's the definition from Wikipedia, so you know it's got to be true, of a blueprint. A blueprint is a high-level plan that guides collaborators through the process of designing and contributing to the development of an open course. That preaches. Can I go back and, and preach it just a little bit? A blueprint is a high-level plan. Watch this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts and my ways are than yours. A blueprint is a high-level plan. The problem is you've been living to, according to a plan that you can see from your level. And if you are looking at a brochure, it's usually in your face. But a blueprint, you have to look. A blueprint is a high-level plan that guides collaborators. Don't, don't ever miss this. The spirit did not show up until the church was on one accord. That, that, that a blueprint requires collaboration with others. It is not an individual uh, undertaking. That the architect needs to depend on engineers. And engineers need to depend on construction workers. And construction workers need to participate with day laborers. And all of these people need to come together to make this thing happen. A blueprint is a high-level plan that guides, thank you for guiding me, Holy Spirit, collaborators through the process. Now, that's a cuss word for people in the church. We don't want to have to go through the process. We want the brochure. We want it to be ready-made. We want it to be done. The process of divine designing and contributing to the development of an open course. Watch this. You don't arrive. 
Don't, don't miss it. As long as you got a pulse, you got a further purpose. That means as long as you're alive, there's something else that God has called you to do. You can be sitting in this room thinking that you've accomplished everything, but God says there's still something else that I've got to do with your life. It's an open course. Watch this. Its purpose is to visualize the overall architecture of the course to guide the design, development, and cooperation process. Now, now, now the reason why I say all of this is to say that the Holy Spirit is the guide. And so what he does is, when the blueprint is given, if you, you can't understand the Bible without the Spirit of God. Ooh, let me say that again. That there are some people who are reading the Bible and they say things like, it's boring. I don't get it. It's ancient. But when I read the Bible and I, and I rely on the Spirit of God to interpret the pages of the, word of the words of the Scripture, the blueprint begins to come alive. And I begin to see the picture that God is making in his kingdom. And I look and I see my part. And I begin to connect with the other believers who need to do their part. And we begin to cooperate together to create what it is that he has designed. The text says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. This is also Paul confirming what it is that Jesus said the Spirit would be. In John chapter 14, verse 26, write this scripture down in the room. Those of you who are online, take a Snapchat, I mean take a picture of the, of the, of the, of the screen. It says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, watch what we'll do. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you, it, it, it's impossible. Have you ever been around somebody who when they start talking, they just start rattling off scripture and you say to yourself, man, this dude has been studying his Bible since he was 10 years old. He knows all of these scriptures. Can I tell you that no memory is that good? That is the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been in a situation where you had somebody ask for your advice or something for, uh, uh, of you and you needed a scripture in that moment? You couldn't recall exactly what it was or where it was and then you found yourself in the middle of it quoting the scripture that the Holy Spirit brought to your remembrance? It's because the Spirit of God in you will teach you and bring to your remembrance all of the things that God has taught you. Let me say this again. I'm up here preaching, the Spirit is teaching. Y'all missed it. I, I, I allowed him to use this, the, the, the study time to orchestrate an outline and to give you some general principles, but you're not going to get the lesson unless the Holy Spirit teaches. No, oh, this is why, Christy, I had to stop taking responsibility for people not necessarily obeying what it is that God taught me that then told me to teach. Here's what it is. At some point, the Spirit's got to be your teacher, and are you receiving or rejecting what it is that he's saying? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me. John 16 and 13 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. You got some decisions you need to make? You need the Holy Spirit. You, you, you want to know who you're going to marry? You need the Holy Spirit. You know what job you need to take? You need the Holy Spirit. You, 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 you want to know what's coming around the corner? The only thing that you can do is rely on the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says he will guide you into all truth. Here's the problem with us. We are finite in our thinking, finite in our understanding, finite in our knowledge. But the Spirit of God, the Bible says, knows all things. And the Bible says he's willing to guide you. This is what I love about him. He's not, you don't have to beg him to guide you. Uh, uh, I was on a, uh, I was on a, I was on a, on a, on a tour uh, in Cancun with my wife. It's, it's one of those, uh, one of those excursions. That's what it's called. One of those excursions, and we were all getting in these little boats. And there was a guy who was in the front, and he was going to be the lead boat. And he was taking us out to this place where we can go scuba dive. Now my wife is more adventurer than I am, and so she gets behind the wheel and she's excited to floor this boat. I'm doing everything I can because I got a weak stomach to hold it together and not give my lunch back to the sea. If you know what I'm talking about. And so, so, so we're in there, and and, and here's what we do. We don't know where we're going. Now, oh, let me, let me say this. I forgot to say this. It was one of those excursions that, that it was, I didn't have to pay for it because uh, we had did one of those presentations. So, so it didn't cost me anything. 
It didn't cost me anything. So we're in there, and as I'm there, I get in the boat with my wife, and she's flooring it, and I'm telling her, you need to slow down. She says, I can't. I said, why? She said, because I got to keep up with the guide. I don't know where I'm going. As long as I can see him, we'll be okay. And the reality is, what I told her was, I was like, listen, we didn't pay for this thing in the first place. I don't need it. Watch this. The guide was there not because of anything we did, because we didn't pay for it. He was paid for it for us. But my wife understood that as long as we had our sights on the guide, we could get to our destination. And if I have anybody who is in the room this morning who is looking at their destination and wondering how they're going to get there, the reality is you've got to keep your eyes on the guide. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is the scripture that should bless your life right here. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Speaking of the coming Messiah, speaking of the teacher who will come. Verse 21 in Isaiah chapter 30 says, and your ears shall hear a word behind you. Oh, watch this. And your ears shall hear a word behind you. That means as you're walking in faith toward what God has for you and you get scared because it seems dark ahead and you get confused because you don't know what's next, the Bible says when you hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Oh, I need you to get this. Isaiah chapter 30 and 21 says, he says, there's going to be a word coming from behind you from the teacher. And he's going to say, this is the way. Walk in it. This is when you've been in that situation and the Holy Spirit told you, you, you need to slow down on the freeway. I was talking to my boy Ralph uh, the other day and he said, I was, on the, I was on the freeway and I saw this dude zoom past me. He said, and something told me that I need to slow down so that I wouldn't be a part of the pile up. He says, he begins to slow down. And he says, three miles later, he goes up and there's a 12 pile accident and the person who was speeding laying on on the ground. He said, thank you, Holy Spirit. Y'all missed it. Because there's a voice that will come from behind you that will start speaking to you to let you know where it is that you should go. This is the way. Walk in it. This is how you need to live your life. Walk in it. These are the people you need to eliminate for this season. Walk in it. This is the stuff you need to lay down. Walk in it. This is the prayer you need to pray. Walk in it. This is the scripture you need to get. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, now, I love 22. I didn't give this to the team. It's an extra right here. Here's what he says. Some of y'all are wondering when you're going to stop struggling with the stuff you struggle with. It's when you start listening to that voice. You, 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 you're wondering when you're going to be able to lay down that thing that's been a habit that you can't let down. I know we don't talk about stuff like that in church no more. We just let people deal with their stuff for 50 years and never say that the Spirit of God has the power to control what it is that you're doing. Oh, well, the Lord gives grace. He does give grace, and grace means power to overcome. Yeah! We reduce grace to an excuse to do what it is that we want to do rather than take grace as power to overcome where we've been. This is 22, Isaiah 30. He says, then you will defile your carved idols. Notice he didn't say discard, Alan. He said, then you'll defile them. You'll be disgusted by them. You'll tear them up. You'll throw them out. He says, then when you begin to listen to the voice of God, you'll defile your, car your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You'll scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. That's a word right there. How am I going to get rid of this nasty habit? I begin to listen to the voice of God. And when the promises of God become true in my life, I don't want anything to do with that thing that destroys my destiny. I don't want anything to do with that thing that distracts me from purpose. I don't want anything to do with that thing that, that makes me less than who God has created me to do. I look at it and I can easily say, be gone. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for guiding me. Point number two, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for accepting me. Woo! Just the one right here. Y'all, we need this one. We need this one. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, watch this, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You, you, you didn't receive the spirit, the one text, one translation says, of bondage. You, you didn't receive the spirit of bondage unto fear. Spirit, spirit, spirit didn't give you you, you do not receive a spirit that causes you to live in constant fear of what might happen. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Paul writes here in agreement with John, in agreement with Jesus, that you did not receive the spirit of slavery. Here's what I need you to understand, that if you belong to Christ, there is no bondage living in you, only freedom. What you're walking in is either agreeing what is in you or not. Jeez, let me say this another way. 
you need to start walking in what, in agreement with what's in you. you. You are free and you need to start walking in freedom. Verse 15 says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But here's the spirit you did receive. You received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for accepting me. My daughters uh, came to me a few weeks ago and they said, Daddy, Daddy, what's the day that we picked up Tux? I said it was December the 12th. I said, they said, it's a good, 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 because on December the 12th, we got to throw Tux a gotcha day party. And I said, what, what is a gotcha day party? I had never heard of this before. And they said, it's celebrating the day that we got him and brought him home. So then I decided to look it up. So I looked up gotcha day. It really has nothing to do with puppies. My kids are culturally appropriating something that is for somebody else. They're culturally appropriating a gotcha day and trying to use it for the puppy. It is really for kids who have been adopted. A, a gotcha day is, is, is a celebration in addition to the birthday of the person who was born to celebrate the day they were adopted and brought home. My daughter's told me that we need to do a gotcha day for, for Tux. Can I tell you that there is a party in heaven every year on your spiritual anniversary. There is a gotcha day. The day that God gave you by his spirit new life, that there is a celebration in heaven over your adoption. The Lord says, I have accepted you because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and I need somebody who is struggling with their identity, somebody who is struggling with their value, somebody who is struggling with their self-worth to understand that because of what Jesus did, on the cross, you never have to question whether you're valuable or not. He settled that back then, 2,000 years ago. His blood talks about what you're worth. His blood tells you what your value is. His blood tells you how much you are worth. You never have to doubt that again in your life. And gotcha day is proof of it. I'll bring up gotcha day because the text says in Romans chapter 15 that we did not receive the spirit of bondage and the fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption. We have been adopted into the family of God. You got to understand who Paul is writing to in order to understand the full context of this. He's writing to Romans. And in Rome, there was this thing about adoption that when you decided to have children, a husband and a wife, out of your own passion, out of your own desire, out of your own choices, you had this baby. And so that child was something that the Roman government and, and everybody else just saw that, hey, you got responsibility for it. You take care of it. You do what you want with it. It was your choice. It's your responsibility. But, but, but the Roman government had a, this is a legal term. This, this word adoption is, is more than just what we see it in the U.S. It is a legal term. And here's what they're literally saying, they're saying, listen, you are choosing to take this child, and if you're choosing to take this child, watch this, this child has more rights than your original children. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. In, in, in this culture, this, this child is literally subject to have more rights than your original child. Oh, we see it in our society today. You watch this. You got, you got a child who's in the home of a person who's adopted that child. The state says, we're going to take care of this child even, even if you can't. We, 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 give, we, we vetted you, you're choosing this child, but at the end of the day, here's what that child has that you don't have. I was watching a comedian, I'm not going to say her name because I'm not going to endorse the special, but she was saying she was arguing with some girl on, on the playground because the girl was telling her that she was adopted and she didn't have no family. She was like, well, your mama and your daddy pay taxes, and what that means is your mama and your daddy love me more because the state take care of me. It was a joke she was saying, but the truth of the matter is she was basically saying, I get benefits from the state. And that adopted child, watch this, not only has the benefit of being accepted into the family, but they get the authority and the backing of the government. Can I talk to somebody who understands what the Holy Spirit does when he comes into your life? Not only does he adopt you into the family where you get a new name, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the name that I get to bear. I get to bear the name of Jesus and that when I'm in Christ, I'm hidden with Christ in God. When I'm in Christ, I'm covered from my sin. When I'm in Christ, I get eternal life. When I'm in Christ, I get all the benefits and the blessings that Ephesians 1 talks about. But also, I get all of the authority and the backing and the provision of heaven simply because the government says, God, if you're going to 
adopt this child, not only are you going to have to take care of him, but we're going to have to make sure that every one of the resources is allocated toward him. And I don't know about you, but when the Bible says, and my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory, which is in Christ Jesus, he's literally saying that I've got governmental resources from heaven that are allocated toward my adopted children. And the text says that you received the spirit of adoption. The spirit sealed you. And that was the legal signature that your adoption is now legal and official. You don't have a lack. You don't have a need. You don't have a problem. The system and the seal of the government says you got everything you need. I need you to understand who you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for accepting me. Why do I make this a point? Because the Father is the one who becomes my Father. Why is this a big deal that the Spirit does it? Well, let me take you back to Matthew chapter number 3, verse 16. Watch this. The, the Father approves whom the Spirit rests on. Jeez. The Father approves whom the Spirit rests on. Y'all missed it. I'm going to say it one more time for the slow people in the back. The Father approves whom the Spirit rests on. So you don't get adoption if it ain't for the Spirit. John was given some specific instructions about Jesus. He says, you look for the one that the Spirit will come down and rest on and remain. We've seen in the Old Testament where the Spirit would move from person to person. But when Jesus came, the Spirit would rest on him and remain. And in Matthew chapter number 3, verse 16 and 17 at Jesus' baptism, the text says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. This is the reason why some of you need to be baptized. Because I believe God is waiting for this moment of obedience to allow the Spirit of God, not to say that your acceptance of Jesus wasn't enough for you to receive the Spirit. But there's a lack of obedience, and so the Spirit is not endorsing yet what it is that God wants to authorize. Yeah, help me, Holy Ghost. I'm, here it is. Matthew 3 says, and when he was baptized, Jesus, can I go here? If Jesus submitted himself to be baptized, what's making your tail think you don't have to be? Did I say tail in church, huh? And when Jesus was baptized, I'm going to read that part of the sentence again. And when Jesus was baptized, you understand that baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. It is, it is showing that I'm cleansed from the inside out. Jesus didn't need to be cleansed, but he submitted himself. But you're telling me that your fake baptism before you were saved when you were seven years old in front of a pressure group of people at your old church was enough for your... I know it's harsh, but it's the reality. And the reason why I'm talking to you is because I was there. I had to be rebaptized because I got baptized at eight years old, threw both my hands up as I surrendered, and my hands and my life were not surrendered to God. And I had to get baptized at 701 Hardwood Road to submit myself under the authority of the Holy Spirit after I had made a conscious decision for what it is that Jesus made. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. Y'all missed what he said. I've read that over and over again, Steph, and I thought it was the heavens were open. Y'all missed what it said. Did y'all read the text? And the heavens were open to him. And the heavens were open to him. You, you declaring that you're going to be living under an open heaven and all of this stuff like that, it sounds good, but it's your obedience that opens heaven. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that saves your soul, but it's your obedience that opens heaven. Ooh, y'all, y'all don't like that teaching. It's cool. I got, I got another point that's going to get worse, so let me, let me just leave you alone. And when Jesus was baptized, that ought to make somebody shout, immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. The Spirit of God comes how? Like a dove. I, I, I had uh, some things in my notes. I cut them out, but I'm going to say this. A dove is one of the most sensitive birds that there could be. And the dove will not rest in a place in which there is no peace. Ooh. A dove will not rest in a place where there is no peace. Go ask Noah. When, when, when he releases uh, the dove from the flood, he was checking to see if there was water there. And the reason why the dove came back, he was like, hey, there's water all out there. I'm coming back. I need, I need, I need to check. You, you, you keep sending them out to do it. The raven was selfish. He'd go out and drink the water and just fly around. But the dove says, I will not rest where there is no peace. Why do I bring that up? I'm telling you about the obedience that creates an open heaven. The dove does not rest where there is no peace. Let me give you this, though. Here's what the voice from heaven said. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. It was the seal of the spirit that led to the declaration of the father. It was the seal of the Spirit that led to the declaration of the, of the Father. Here's what I need you to understand. That the, the reason why you say thank you, Holy Spirit, for accepting me 
is because when the spirit sees, watch this, that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is guarding your heart and your mind. When Jesus says, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, but I give you my peace, and you accept Jesus Christ, but now you have peace with God, the book of Romans says. When the Lord sees that you have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, the spirit comes and rests on you and the father begins to affirm you. And every resource that the father has in heaven becomes yours in the name of Jesus. That's what the text is teaching us. It says, this is my beloved son or daughter, if that's relating to you, whom I am well pleased. John 14, 16 through 18 says this, of the spirit accepting us and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. I, I'm around a lot of people, Oza, but the people I'm going to spend extended amounts of time with are the folk I got to like. The, the text says that I will ask the Father, he will send you another helper to be with you forever. Ah, the Spirit got a tough job because he's got to stay with folk who I wouldn't necessarily want to kick your head. The Spirit's got a tough job because he's got to hang out with folk who oftentimes don't want to hang with him. The Spirit's got a tough job. He, he's, got to, he's got to be involved with people that other people would run from in any moment. But here's what the Spirit says. The Spirit says, listen, it's not about what you've done. It's about who I am. This is what I do. He says, it's not about what you've done. It's about who I am. This is what I do. Can I go back to Jesus' baptism for just a second? The Spirit descends on Jesus, and, and watch this, and the Father says, I'm well pleased. Jesus hadn't done anything but be baptized. All he did was surrender, and the Spirit comes, and the Father affirms. Y'all missed it. Jesus hasn't done anything. All he does is surrender, and the Spirit comes, and the Father affirms. Jesus hasn't done anything. All he does is surrender, and the Spirit comes, and the Father affirms. Can I tell you that it is not your works that get God's attention. It is your surrender that gets God's attention. The reason why I'm talking to you about obedience is not so that you can work harder, but so that you can surrender sooner. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Watch this. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is pre-resurrection. The spirit was with him because he was with Jesus. But then after the resurrection, he is now in them. Acts chapter number two. Here's what he says in the last verse. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Here's what Jesus says. He says, listen, I'm a friend and I got to leave and the situation that we've been in is going to change, but I will not leave you as orphans. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for accepting me because the Father now affirms me because of your seal of approval on me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for accepting me because the Father now affirms me because of your seal of approval on me. Last point, I'm done. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit for challenging me. <laughs> yeah, this, that one right here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For challenging me. Remember I told you that these principles are not just principles that we find in the friendship of the Holy Spirit, but you need to find them in the people that you are with. If you got people who are around you who cannot guide you with truth, you better evaluate what that relationship is like. If you got people around you who do not accept you for who you are, you need to evaluate what those relationships are like. If you got people around you who let you just do anything you want to do and don't challenge you, you better evaluate those relationships. The University of Alabama has won six championships in the last two decades, and one of the things that they attribute to their beauty of, uh, of, their, of their, their beauty of their, their their competition is the fact that they compete at a high level in practice. That, that, that watch this, Trey. What happens is when you get into a practice and you're a, a, an Alabama wide receiver going against an Alabama DB, you're already facing the best. Wow. And so what happens is inside of your camp, inside of your team, there's somebody who's going to challenge you harder than the enemy that's opposed to you. Inside of your camp, there's somebody who's willing to give you a greater resistance to make you stronger so that when you face the enemy, you say, this ain't nothing. I already faced this from friendly fire. Uh, let me see if I can help somebody to understand what it is that I'm saying. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 says this. Romans 8 and 17 says, watch, I uh, lost my place in my Bible. 17, and if children, watch this because they say we're, we're uh, the spirit bears with himself that with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided, everybody want to be an heir. But he says there's a provision, there's a clause. There, there's, there's, there's an understanding. Provided we suffer with him 
in order that we might also be glorified with him. Heirs, glorification, but the meat in that sandwich is suffering. Y'all missed it. I'm going to be an heir with Jesus. I'm going to be glorified with Jesus. If you're going to put that bread together, there's some bologna in the middle, and it's suffering. Y'all don't eat bologna sandwiches. I don't know what you eat. Hot chicken. I don't eat any of it. Here's what he says. He says, there, there are some things that I want to provide for you, but the reality is I need you to suffer. Now, y'all saying, ooh, pastor, I don't like this message on suffering. But, but, but you read the text too fast. You know, that's one of my things. You, it's not that you don't read your Bible. It's that you read it too fast. Notice what the text says. The text says, if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Provided we suffer with him. Wait a minute. Provided we suffer with him. The spirit is not just going to allow you to go through your life without any struggle or suffering because he understands that, watch this, I told you the spirit is the most exclusive member of the Trinity. So he understands that outside of the relationship that he has with me and you and the saints, he says, when I'm going to encounter the world, in this life you will have a struggle. In this life you will suffer. In this life there will be drama. Here's what the spirit says. I need you to learn how to suffer with Christ. I need you to go to practice and wrestle with some things. This is the reason why? If you're going to conquer that lust on a date, you got to conquer that lust in private. They don't want me to talk like that. If you, if you, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. If, if, you, if you're wondering what your finances are going to be like in the future, you're going to have to learn how to tithe. Oh, can I talk about this? I mean, I'm just talking about, what are we talking about suffering with Christ? I'm not even talking, we live in America, y'all. I'm not even talking about persecution, Alan. We can go to a whole other country and talk about real persecution. I'm talking about suffering with Christ. Like, you don't have ownership of your own finances. He says, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And here's what he says. He says, he says holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. What am I doing with my temple? He said, provided that you suffer with him. I love the fact that he says, suffer with him. Can I go back to my Alabama analogy? What Jesus is saying is, if you wrestle with me, when you get up against the enemy, you're going to say, I've seen strength greater than this. And I've submitted myself to strength greater than this, but it also has built me up to be able to fight against the resistance of the enemy. God is saying to somebody today, if you would just suffer with me, you'll be able to defeat the enemy. Yeah. He said, here it is, the challenge of a teammate prepares you for the struggle of the opponent. The, the spirit is never going to allow you to just walk into a fight that you are unprepared for. And he's been doing it for you before you gave Jesus your life. You didn't know it. John 16, 8 says this. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Notice this, that before you were saved, it was the Holy Spirit who convicted you of your sin. That made you believe that you need to give your life to Jesus. He calls this struggle. And here's what he learned how to do. He, said, he says, in this struggle, you're going to learn how to submit and you're going to gain some strength. You're going to learn how to submit and you're going to gain some strength. He says, in this life, he says, he says, he's going to convict the word of sin and of righteousness. The spirit challenges my comfort so that I can be strengthened for my calling. I suffer with him so that I am prepared to suffer for him. There are some of us who have not suffered with Christ in the private parts of our lives. And so when it's time to struggle for Christ in these public arenas, we don't have a clue how to do it. We're not strong enough to do it. But you never go through it alone. You suffer with Christ. And the Spirit is in you, which means the Spirit is also in the fight. Y'all missed it. The Spirit is in you, which means he's also in the fight. So many of us are scared of the suffering because we think we got to be the ones fighting. So many of us are scared of the suffering because we think we're the ones that got to sustain. So many of us are scared of suffering because we think we're the ones that God is going to have to, that, that, that we're going to have to be the one to overcome. And God says, no, greater is he that is in me than he that is of, of the world. He says, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And if he's in me, he's already overcome the world. I told somebody on Wednesday night that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You already win because the spirit is within. You already win because you've got God's power and presence on the inside of you. The spirit is in you, which means he's also in the fight. 
Uh, there are two parents that were trying to sleep train their baby. And as they were trying to sleep train their baby, uh, the husband was so weak every time because his baby girl uh, would want to uh, wake up in the middle of the night. And he wanted to go grab her and he wanted to take her into the room and sleep with her in the bed. And the mama said, you know, when, when it comes to, to boys, men are hard. When it comes to girls, mamas are hard. And that's my household. I'm, I'm easy with the girls. And so what happens is the daddy was soft because he didn't want to hear his baby girl cry. So in the middle of the night, he would find himself going to the bed and he would grab that baby and he would take her back to his bed and he would just hold her and he would hold her. And the mama said, you can do it. She said, we got we to gotta train this baby. He said, okay, here it is. Uh, so one night she looked at him. She said, baby, this baby's going to cry, but she's never going to get it if you keep taking her out. If you keep taking her out of the bed, she's never going to understand how to sleep on her own. She said, promise me. She looked at her husband. She said, promise me. You will not take her out of this bed. He said, I promise. She said, no, 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 no. We've been here before. Promise me you will not take this baby out the bed. He looked at her. He said, baby, trust me. She said, no, I'm not trusting you because you always grab that baby. Promise me you will not take this baby out the bed. He says, I promise. They go to bed. The baby starts crying in the middle of the night. The mom is just sleeping through it. The husband slowly sneaks out of the bed. He goes into the room where the baby is laying in the bed. He lays in the bed with her. The mama wakes up in the middle of the night because she finds that her husband is not there. He gets, she gets to the room and she says, baby, you told me that you were going to let this baby sleep. by." She said, no, no, no. You told me to promise that I wouldn't take her out. But you didn't say I couldn't be in here with her. Can I talk to somebody who the Lord is talking to you today? That he said when he prayed, Jesus prayed, Lord, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you will be with them in it. Here's what he says. I promised that I wouldn't take you out, but I didn't say I wouldn't be with you in it. If you're going through some hard times, here's what the Lord says. I'm in the fight with you. He's laying in the struggle with you. He's laying in the suffering with you. He's staying in it with you. And the Lord told me to tell you today, all you got to do is when you get a little nervous, when you're crying in the middle of the night, and you're wondering why he hasn't snatched you out of the situation, look behind you. The Lord is laying there making sure that you feel comforted by his presence. Sometimes all I need to know is that he's in me. Sometimes all I need to know is that he's in the fight with me. Sometimes all I need to know is that he's there. Maybe I'm not coming out of this situation. Maybe it's not going to turn around. Maybe it won't get better anytime soon. But if he's there with me, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God says, I'll be there with you in Isaiah. When you pass through the waters and through the fire and through the flood, I'll be with you. God told me to tell somebody today, don't look at your circumstance. Look in the bed. He's with you. Maybe, just maybe. Your problem isn't your problem. Your perspective is your problem. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm going through. How, how can you say thank you in a time like this? Because he's with me. I look back, Mike, and I look back on times in my life where I thought I was alone. And I look back and I see he was with me. There are times in my life where, where I wondered, why didn't God change that circumstance? He said, because I was with you and I strengthened you through it. And you learned things in that heartache that you never would have learned in ease. I wish I had three or four people who understood what it was like to suffer through something and come out stronger. But knowing that because the Lord was with you, it couldn't destroy you. Maybe you're looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, he's yelling and sweating and preaching and hollering. And he's passionate about it. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. God did not give us a spirit of bondage again to fear, a spirit of adoption by which we call Abba. Can I go back there for just one second? And then we're out of here. Maybe the reason why it doesn't resonate with you is because God is hopater. Alan, you know Greek, you're a little bit better than me in, in the Greek. Uh, hopatir is just, it's a familial term that talks about the head of the household. It, it, is, it, is, a, it is a term that is, that is from the head of the household. And so when you call it patir, paternal, it, it's a position. 
maybe you know God positionally. Maybe, maybe you know him as the ruler of the universe. Maybe you know him as the creator of all things. But, but, but the spirit of adoption is by which I cry, Abba. Abba is a term of endearment. Abba is a term of closeness. Abba is a term of relationship. This is not positional. It's relational for me. Maybe, 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 maybe I had a man one time, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm done. I had a man one time. He was dying. He was dying. He was dying. If I said his name, some of you would know him. He called me to his hospital bed, dying from pancreatic cancer. He called me to his hospital bed, and he asked me this. He said, when I watch you preach and sing and teach Sunday school, I was at another church then. He said, I see this passion in you. I said, where does that come from? I had a two-word answer. Holy Spirit. Yeah, maybe he was expecting me to talk about some deep practice that I had, that I had done. No. No, no, no. It, it had become an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit that caused everything that I said to be not, watch this, I'm not convinced, I'm convicted. Yeah. There's a difference. You can give me your logical explanations that can help me to be convinced that your argument is intellectual, that it's good, but I've been convicted. There's something in my heart that says I've been through some things with God that have shown me that what it is that God says in his word is true. Titus, we both know what it's like to pray for a child that they don't think you can have, and then God provides one for you. I got some people in the room who know what it's like to lose a loved one and think maybe you're going to fall apart, but then the Lord keeps your mind. You're not just convinced, you're convicted. I know some people who've been brought out of situations, your own sin should have let you down and taken you into destruction, but the forgiveness of God caused the hearts of men to forgive you, embrace you, and bring you back. I know what it's like to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And so I don't call him Ho Patir. I call him Abba. It's not, it's not positional. This is relational. How do you get that? Whether you're in the room or you're online, you get that simply by saying, listen, Jesus, I believe what it is that you have done. This is maybe where you need to be convinced. You need to be convinced that you're a sinner. You need to be convinced that the fact of the matter is Jesus died for that sin, that you don't have to live in the consequences and the, in the, in the eternal damnation of that sin, that you can surrender your life to him today. And simply by surrendering your life to him, the Spirit will seal your life for him. I need you to understand online or in person. When I give these invitations at the end of the message, this is not a programmatic theme that we do at the end of a message. This is me saying that the whole purpose of me talking this whole time was to get you closer to the Lord. That if you already believe, I need you to have an intimate, Abba-like relationship with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you have been listening to me and you are not convinced yet, I need you to understand that you only get this when you surrender to Jesus. It is a life transformation. I'm not just convinced, no. I'm convicted. I'm convicted. And I pray that you would be too. I'm going to pray a prayer. And that prayer is simply just going to invite you into the family of God. We said that he adopts us into his family and it's simply only things you have to do is accept the fact that he's coming. Listen, he's been coming for you your whole life. Every condition and situation and circumstance, he's been coming for you. He's been planning your adoption before it was an idea in your mind. You, you, you understand there are some parents that are planning the adoption long before the kid is even born. And the Lord's been planning your gotcha day since before you were even born. And today is your day. And here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that as I'm praying this prayer, the only thing that you have to do is not run out of the orphanage and say, God, I don't want nothing to do with you. Let him take you home. As I'm praying this prayer, all you have to do is just receive the words that I'm saying. Receive what it is that God is doing in your heart. Surrender to it. And God, listen, the prayer is not magical. It's just me helping and aiding and guiding you by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're online, I pray that you would agree with me. If you're saved, if you're not, I pray that you would hear these words and come into this conviction. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your son that you sent into the world to live the life I could not live. He lived this sinless life and he died this sacrificial death died in my place, the place where I should have died. The Bible says that, that, that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus shed his blood so my sin could be forgiven. And today I thank you for it, God. I receive that forgiveness by saying I surrender my life to you. Maybe it's for the first time. Maybe it's a renewal. Maybe it's a recommitment. But today, God, I surrender my life to you. I ask you with everything in me to seal me with your spirit. And I pray that as the Spirit seals me, Father, I thank you that I'm accepted and affirmed by you. I, I receive my new position in the kingdom. 
I receive this authority that you give me. I receive the adoption that comes on behalf of what it is that you have done for me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today. God, I, I will do whatever it is that you ask me and require me to do next. In Jesus' name, I thank you and praise you. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, I am going to give some uh, instructions for those of us who are in the room. Leslie's going to give instructions for those of you who are online. I appreciate you being here. Listen, right now, take it away, Leslie. Yes, what a word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being a friend. If you made a choice today, text the word forward to 94000. We would love to walk with you as you continue your journey forward. Here at Freedom Church, we don't just give, we bring it. Whether you are joining us in the building or online, you can give using one of our three platforms, MyFreedomDFW.com, our app, or the Fast and Easy, Easy Cash app, MyFreedomDFW. Life groups. Life groups are in full effect. They are still going on, and you can still join. If you're not sure which group is right for you or you need some more information, go ahead and send us a text at 94000, and we'd love to help you get started. All day Wednesdays, we pray. Be sure to join us live on Facebook and YouTube at 6 a.m., noon, and 7 p.m. You are sure to be blessed. And this Wednesday is our first Wednesday, so first Wednesday service will follow that final prayer of the day at 7.15, also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Don't forget to stay connected with us throughout the week. We'd love to hear from you. You can always reach out to us on our website, social media, or you can always text that same number, 94000. Have a great week, a wonderful rest of your holiday weekend. And until we see each other online again, my name is Leslie, and remember, we live faith forward.